I open this public session of the College of Deans. From the Christian origins of FU Amsterdam to the polychromatic academic community that we are today, our scientific practice is intertwined with fundamental values and a sense of wonder. Please be seated. Esteemed guests and colleagues, Madam President of the Executive Board, Professor Mejan van Praag, friends and family of Professor Reutemann, students and everyone joining us for this special occasion, either here in the main auditorium of Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam or connected through digital means. It is a true privilege indeed to welcome you all to this academic ceremony in which our colleague Jessica Vance Reutemann will deliver her inaugural address as Professor of Jewish Studies at the Faculty of Religion and Theology of Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Please allow me to introduce her briefly. Jessica Reutemann was born in Richmond, Kentucky in 1971. She grew up with her sister Susanna as the daughters of Lida and Joel Reutemann. Her father was Professor of American History at Eastern Kentucky University. It's an honor to welcome here Prof. Reutman Sr., Susanna and other family, with a special shout out to Jessica's son, Maximilian Darius. Jessica's mother, Lida, who passed away last October, is dearly missed today. Jessica Reutman's academic development included a BA in religion at Maryville College, magna cum laude, and an MA in Latin American studies at Vanderbilt University, summa cum laude. During a visit to Brazil, she got intrigued by the Jewish history in Latin and South America and its relation to European Jewish history. From 2003 to 2008, she worked as a PhD candidate at Leiden University and defended her thesis in 2009, titled Us and Them, Intercultural Trait and the Sephardim, 1595-1640. Her thesis was published with Braille Publishers in 2011. One of the 10 statements accompanying that thesis testifies to her global scope of interest. I quote, no European should be allowed to condemn an American for not having traveled outside of North America unless he or she has actually ventured beyond the borders of Europe. Needless to say, she herself went above and beyond. Meanwhile, Dr. Reutemann worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Birkbeck College at the University of London, Leiden University, partly in conjunction with Université Paris 1, Paris 1 and Oxford, and the Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies for Dutch people, KITLV. She published about Atlantic colonial trade, Jewish settlements in the Americas, slavery and abolition in the Dutch Caribbean, and the intersection of gender, sexuality, religion, race, and the social economic position. On February the 1st, 2021, Jessica Reutemann was appointed Professor of Jewish Studies at the Faculty of Religion and Theology at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Her chair was established in cooperation with the Manasseh and Israel Institute and supported by the Municipality of Amsterdam as part of a program to amend for historical wrongdoings. Jewish families who were deported from the city by German forces during the war were fined after the war for not paying their ground lease. To compensate for this injustice, the city decided to contribute an equivalent amount to initiatives that would benefit the Jewish community. And this chair was one of the projects selected. We are grateful to be part of this historical retribution, and we have turned this temporal support into a permanent chair. It is my pleasure to now give the floor to Professor Reutemann for her inaugural address titled Jews, history, and homemaking, colonial contradictions, and contemporary challenges. A week from tonight, my favorite Jewish holiday, Pesach or Passover begins. <laughs> 
I always joke that what's not to like about a holiday celebrated by a four course or more multi-course meal in which one is commanded to drink at least four glasses of wine. Like so many Jewish holidays, the overarching theme could be condensed to, they tried to kill us, they failed, let's eat. But of course, Pesach is so much more than this. The central tenet of the Seder, the meal and the service that accompanies it, is the retelling of the story of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. A liberation from slavery that leads directly to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but finally ends in Canaan, the promised land. It's about the idea that God acts in history. In fact, the injunction is repeated throughout the reading of the Haggadah, the book that narrates the evening. As it is said, you shall tell your child on that day because of what God did for me when he took me out of Egypt. As an historian, this obviously appeals to me to make sure that history is passed from one generation to another. It's also what keeps me employed. Like most history though, it's also about how to interpret the story, what lessons we draw from that history. And there are many lessons that could be drawn from the retelling of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. One of the lessons is about the tensions between exile and home that is so palpable in the story. The tension is also clear in the story of Jews, millennia after the exodus from Egypt, who settled in the Caribbean, particularly the Dutch Caribbean, in the early modern and the modern periods. Taking this history as a point of departure, I want to speak about questions of Jewishness and homemaking in colonial contexts. Jews and other in-between groups such as free people of color offer crucial insights into the tensions and contradictions within colonial societies more broadly. I'd like to contemplate why the story is relevant, not just for Jewish studies, but more broadly for contemporary scholarly and societal debates. Exile and home are themes that frame my academic work, but also resonate in my own life. I grew up as a Jew in Kentucky in the American Bible Belt, as Ruard mentioned. I didn't always feel at home there. Yet if I wasn't at home there, why was it when I talk about home, even after 22 years of calling the Netherlands home, I'm most always talking about Kentucky. Horse racing, bourbon, and college basketball are all signifiers of belonging in Kentucky. Are my fondness for all three really about a need to claim an identity and a sense of belonging as a Kentuckian because I never truly fit in? Maybe. If so, I'm in good company and a perhaps somewhat exaggerated proclamation of a local identity. The Surinamese luminary David Nasi wrote extensively in the 18th century about the history of his long established Jewish community in this Dutch colony. He wrote, and I quote, Surinamese Jews not only bore arms on the Sabbath, but that they did so even on Yom Kippur. Did they have any scruple to combat the black maroons on the Sabbath? Was it not on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, that they defeated a considerable troop of these rebels? Unquote. Likewise, a century later, another in another Dutch American colony of Curaçao, the Jewish lawyer Abraham Mendes Chumachero wrote, and I quote, the Jews are as connected to Curaçao as any other group because no matter where they go, they return to their beloved land of birth, unquote. These two Jews writing a century apart in Dutch Caribbean colonies are asserting loyalty and belonging of being at home, it, being at home in these places. Homemaking has two related dimensions, the physical and the metaphysical. A home can, at its simplest, be a house where one lays one's head, a physical space in which one lives, like my family and I lived at 306 South 3rd Street in Richmond, Kentucky. 
When we sold the house in which I grew up soon before my mother died, I felt unmoored. I had lost the physical embodiment of where I knew I belonged, home. So calling a place a home suggests something metaphysical, an emotional connection that has been constituted by the shared history of the place and the space and those who live there. Home as an idea represents belonging. The emotional side of home has been problematized as at-homeness in exile in Jewish studies, highlighting tensions between different heritages, including the tension between the biblical promised land and later diasporic locations. The overarching model for Jewish history has been that of center or core and the periphery. But Jewish history has had many cores and many peripheries. New York has been conceived of as the primary diasporic center for, or core for the Jews, especially the now mythologized Lower East Side where Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, like my own ancestors, created a new and vibrant life. But there are other cores, the biblical homeland, now the state of Israel, of course, but Spain or Amsterdam, and perhaps surprisingly to some of you, Curacao or Suriname. This earlier Jewish diaspora is often forgotten with the rise of North American Jewish communities from the late 19th century. The story of the migration of Eastern European Jews like my great grandparents to the United States between 1880 and 1920 became the dominant narrative in Jewish history. This is an almost teleological account in which the United States is the promised land, the home of the Jews on par with, or maybe even surpassing the state of Israel. Perhaps not surprisingly, this story is written mostly by Jewish American historians of Ashkenazi descent. This privileging of 19th and 20th century Ashkenazi American history has led until relatively recently to the near erasure of other Jewish groups in the standard narrations of Jewish history. Curacao was the hub and New York was the peripheral backwater of American Jewry well into the 19th century. In the 18th century, Dutch Caribbean colonies constituted the center of Jewish life in the Americas, whereas open Jewish life continued to be forbidden and persecuted in the Spanish, Portuguese, and French Americas. Dutch Caribbean colonies looked back on more than a century of blossoming Jewish settlement. First Brazil, under Dutch rule, then the Caribbean, especially the Dutch Caribbean, were where the majority of Jews in the Americas lived. In 1790, there were 1,330 Jews in Suriname, 1,100 in Curaçao, 900 in Jamaica, but around only 350 in New York and 200, 250 in Philadelphia. Jews began making their home in jungle-choked deltas like Suriname, and Essequibo, now part of Guiana, and barren islands like Curaçao, almost from the beginning of Dutch colonization. To paraphrase the Passover Haggadah, which asks, why is this night different from all other nights? Why were these places different from all other places for Jews? For one, this homemaking in a new place occurred conceptually and literally within a framework of Dutch colonialism. Jews became imbricated in the issues that colonialism engenders, discrimination, racism, and enslavement. Colonialism also provided them, somewhat contradictorily, with a space, a new home, shared by different, sometimes rival groups. So why would Jews be have become part of these early colonial ventures in places so far from what seemed like the core of Jewish life, Livorno, Amsterdam for the Portuguese and Spanish Jews who were the bulk of the initial settlers. Greater freedom, for Jews at least, was one reason. Jews were willing to settle in these rather inhospitable regions because they were granted special rights. Those rights not only concerned congregational autonomies, but also included tax exemptions, rights to trade, to take non-Christian oaths, exemptions from activities on Jewish holidays, and the right to serve in the militia. This was far more freedom than Jews had in almost any other place in Europe, 
including the core home community of Amsterdam. It also included the right to own estates and enslaved people, most of whom were of African descent. One of the contradictions of the Jewish experience of colonialism then is that it allowed Jews who made their homes in these colonies greater freedom, but it also solidified difference, most specifically notions of racialized difference. For like the Christians, these Jews exploited enslaved Africans and forced them to make their homes in these colonial spaces. So how did Jews make a home in these places so far from the centers of Jewish life that they had known? Historically, Jews' understanding of home was made up of everyday practices and relationships to local communities. The prophet Jeremiah, who witnessed the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE and the subsequent Babylonian exile, suggested that Jews needed to be at home wherever they were while still maintaining a memory of place that connected them to Zion. Jeremiah told Jews to root themselves in their new community, quote, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, multiply, do not decrease, unquote. And following Jeremiah's call, multiply they did in the Dutch Caribbean. By the mid to late 18th century, anywhere from a third to a half of the white population in Curaçao and Suriname were Jewish. The texts of rabbinic culture offer an extended meditation on how to be at home in the world, where the rabbis perceive themselves and their followers as physically outside the land, as living amongst others who didn't share their religious beliefs and practices. These Jewish communities in the colonies did this by establishing homes for the dead, cemeteries. This was a very concrete act of claiming both place and space for themselves and meant acquiring land and investing it with cultural and metaphysical power. The cemeteries are testimony to the rootedness of these Jewish communities in these places. The oldest Jewish tom tombstone in Beth Haim Cemetery outside Willemstad, Curaçao, for instance, dates from 1668. Jews also established traditional schools and mikvahs, ritual baths in the colonies places off limits to the cultures and peoples around them. These private spaces within the community served as the foundations from which to construct community. These three spaces, cemeteries, ritual baths, and schools were cornerstones of how Jews engaged in homemaking in the Caribbean colonies. Knowledge of Jewish ritual and practice was also important for creating a home, and the communities built synagogues. Mikveh Israel Emmanuel in Willemstad, Curaçao is the oldest continuing operating synagogue in the Western Hemisphere, and its sand-covered floors still muffle the sounds of weekly Shabbat services, but there are many other places of worship throughout the Caribbean as well. One important trait that all 17th and 18th century Caribbean Jewish communities shared was that with these synagogues as bases, they, strongly linked, they were strongly linked to the religious home in Amsterdam. The Amsterdam congregation provided Torah scrolls, clerics, and ruled on questions concerning the community. Yet as the Jewish communities in these colonial spaces became more entrenched, they began to question the authority of their once home community of Amsterdam. Instead, they oriented themselves towards regional traditions and towards Curaçao, the new center of Caribbean Jewry. In 1789, the Curaçao community boycotted the prohibition on men shaving their beards between Passover and the holiday of Shavuot, celebrated seven weeks later. It was seen as a statute that was imported from Amsterdam and inappropriate and unsanitary for Caribbean contexts. Here we find echoes of a much older story of settlement and homemaking in the Jewish past. One passage from the Passover Haggadah describes how Joseph was not recognized by his brothers when they traveled to Egypt. One common interpretation is that Joseph was not recognizable to his brothers as either family or as a Jew because he had assumed the fashions and the mannerisms of the Egyptians, much as it seems the men of the Jewish community had done on Curaçao in the late 18th century. Jews on Curaçao also spoke Papiamentu, the local Creole language amongst themselves, as well as with African descended peoples. In fact, the first written letters in Papiamentu were between two Sephardic lovers. <laughs> 
Assimilation, or fear of it, is a constant theme in discussions of Jewish history, culture, and contemporary life, as it was for Joseph in Egypt or the Jewish community on Curaçao. Feeling at home and having a sense of attachment and comfort in one's social and physical surroundings is part of Jews making their home somewhere, but it's also laden with the fear of being too much at home at the expense of religious tradition or group identification. An attachment to a local place is as much a part of Jewish history as is the condition of exile or diaspora or dispersion or migration as we see in the Caribbean. This is a powerful counter narrative to the well-known and largely negative stereotype of the wandering Jew. People who are not rooted in place have always been viewed with suspicion and as menaces to society. Yet when Jews are too long in one place, too rooted, too at home, they're also viewed as a threat. Again, we hear the resonance with the Passover story. We read in the Haggadah that Pharaoh said, quote, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. In the event of war, they will join our enemies in fighting against us and gain ascendancy over the country, unquote. Pharaoh is presaging a theme that will emerge again and again in every generation, as we are told during the Seder meal. That is the distrust of Jews for being too numerous, too powerful, and too other. This is a view that David Nasi, who I quoted earlier, was countering. Unlike the rest of the white population who were, as Governor Mauritius of Suriname lamented in 1740, quote, foreigners who have no patriotic feelings and always preserve the impetus to return to Europe, unquote. According to Nasi, the Jews were the true and useful colonists, unquote. Nasi's assertions of belonging feel defensive, and with reason, 18th century writers such as Voltaire and especially and most famously the Dutch English soldier John Gabriel Stedman depicted Suriname's system of plantation enslavement as extremely cruel. In Suriname, where a high proportion of plantations were owned by Jews, narratives of brutal Jewish slave owners spread and entered discourses amongst freed and fugitive slaves. Various late 18th century geographies and travel accounts describe the uprisings experienced by Surinamese planters by their enslaved chattel. Maltreatment of slaves was viewed as the immediate cause. Most Jewish owned plantations were situated in the frontier of the colony, which made them particularly vulnerable to these attacks. David Nasi wrote about such raids. He described how Jews did not scruple to combat the black maroons on the Sabbath, and even defeated a group of these people on Yom Kippur. For Nasi, this was something laudable. Jews defended their colony on their holiest day. For later writers, the fact that some of the most famous cases of maroon attacks and collective escapes took place on Jewish plantations was evidence that Jewish planters generally maltreated their enslaved people. Most of these accounts of cruel Jewish planters actually date from the mid 19th century when the discussion about the abolition of slavery was most heated. They were written during a period in which the emancipation of Jews in Europe went hand in hand with growing anti-Semitism, an anti-Semitism reflected in some of the works published on slavery in Suriname. A clear example of the employment of anti-Semitic tropes in Dutch abolitionist writing was written by W.R. von Heuvel. Writing in 1855, he said, quote, there are many Israelites in Suriname, many of them are penny pinching, always ready to profit from the blood and sweat of their slaves and like all cowards, cruel to their subordinates, unquote. This is rather ironic because this is also a period when Jews no longer participated on a large scale in Suriname's plantation economy. Jews were still the largest group of local whites in the colony though. Representing Jewish slaveholders as people who brutalized their slaves in the blind pursuit of financial gain illustrates an ambiguous position of Jews in Caribbean white communities. Black, or not black, but of a special white, but not quite, white, but Jewish status. It wasn't unique to the Dutch Caribbean, 
Jewish planters in Jamaica were also depicted as being particularly cruel. The image of the cruel Jewish planter turned the notion of Jewish whiteness and colonial elite status into a discourse on Jewish otherness, part of the elite, but not quite, different, worse. The dominance normally associated with whiteness was effectively counteracted by making the Jews different and worse. The representation of the Surinamese Jew as a harsh and cruel slaveholder persisted long after slavery had been abolished in 1863. During a meeting of Suriname's Colonial Assembly in 1947, the nationalist politician W. Bolsverschur attempted to prevent the settlement of 30,000 displaced European Jews. He claimed that the arrival of large numbers of Jews would open up old wounds. Quote, the former role of Jewish immigrants as plantation owners and slave owners was of such nature that not all memories hereto have been erased, unquote. Abraham Mendez Chumachero, who I quoted earlier, was born and raised in the colony of Curaçao. When he stated that, quote, the Jews are as connected to Curaçao as any other group because no matter where they go, they return to their beloved land of birth, unquote, he was responding to another screed written by the in the 19th century by a white Christian Dutchman. The pamphlet written by colonial official J.H.J. Hommelberg argued strongly against giving voting rights after emancipation to either Jews or afro curaçaoans Hommelberg believed that neither group were suitable voters. Jews were unsuitable because they were not really loyal to the Netherlands, but first and foremost to their own group. This concern for Jewish loyalty dogs Jews wherever they settle, wherever they make home, from Pharaoh's Egypt to the Caribbean. This is the view that Chumachero counters. His pamphlet was an early example of a shared sense of experience and solidarity amongst African descended people and Jews in colonial spaces, the spaces both groups called home. In his pamphlet, Chumachero also argued for the enfranchisement of the afro curaçaoan population based on his experience with very capable and intelligent Black students. This is an oft forgotten counterweight to the oppositional relationship between Jews and African descended populations created by the idea of competitive victimization. The celebration of Passover reminds Jews every year and in every generation that we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Every time I give a talk to the public about Jews in the Caribbean, I'm asked what Natalie Zeman Davis called the Passover question. How, if every year and through every generation, Jews are commanded to always remember that you were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, could Jews have owned people? What did Jews do at Passover in colonies such as Curaçao, Suriname, Barbados, Jamaica, where they enslaved people? I asked myself the same question, even though, of course, it was white Christian Europeans, not Jews, who introduced racial slavery in the Americas. In Leviticus, after the Lord brought forth the people of Israel, his servants out of the land of Egypt, he instructed Moses that they were not to buy and sell each other, but only those of the nations around them, children of the strangers that sojourn amongst you. This passage has always provided a handy explanation and even justification for enslaving non-Jews. But I still ask myself the Passover question, even though historian David Brian Davis reminds us that the acceptance of the institution of slavery, if not of one's own kind, then of others, was so widespread and enduring that the emergence of abolition movements in the 18th century was, to quote Davis, a momentous turning point in the evolution of man's moral perception, unquote. Brian Davis is no doubt right. Nevertheless, it is perhaps disappointing, saddening, infuriating. Jews such as myself read every year at Passover, as we will next week, that the Jews suffered in Egypt. As the Haggadah narrates, with hard labor at mortar and brick and in all sorts of work in the field, with all the tasks ruthlessly imposed upon them. 
We may wonder how our brethren making their homes in these American colonies ruthlessly imposed hard labor in the fields and elsewhere on another group of enslaved people. We may feel confused that they engaged in racism and dehumanization, just as we had been singled out and dehumanized in Egypt. In classic Jewish historiography, the Passover problem has largely been ignored. The drama of the early modern period was written as the gradual move towards Jewish emancipation, not Jewish participation with Christians in oppressive colonial regimes. This represents both a Eurocentric view of history in general and Jewish history specifically. This has begun to change. My research and that of other colleagues, such as Sina Rauschenbach, who I'm very honored to have in the room, and friends and colleagues such as Aviva Benur, Elite Surowitz, Lara Liebman, and so many others working in the field have begun to challenge this prevailing privileging of European focused, largely Ashkenazi history. I hope to keep pushing against these paradigms in my future research, but I also intend to look at what the importance of the stories of Jews making their home in the Caribbean is today, in general, but also for Jewish history and Jewish studies. Jews have tended to be framed as connected with imperial powers. This in the Caribbean, as I've described, is largely true, however uncomfortable it might make us. Jews are also typically essentialized and stigmatized or stereotypically cast as being part of the power elite and enjoying white privilege. Again, this is at least partially true in the case of the Caribbean. However, this is also an approach that has seemed to be predicated upon the colonizer colonized binary and the idea that victims of anti Semitism and of racism exist in two hermetically sealed historical settings. After all, Jews were part of European colonial endeavors, not just in the Caribbean, but also, for instance, in places as far, as far afield as Australia, South Africa, Malaysia, or French North Africa. Albert Mimi, the preeminent critic of colonialism, wrote of his experience as a Jew in French colonized Morocco in the early 20th century. In his novel, The Pillar of Salt, his frustrated teenage protagonist, based largely on his own experience, talks of how, quote, I'm African, not European. In the long run, I would always be a native in a colonial country, a Jew in an anti-Semitic universe, an African in a world dominated by Europe, unquote. Mimi was not the only post-colonial thinker to question the colonizer colonized binary. Others such as Franz Fanon, Hannah Arndt, Amy Césaire, and Jean-Paul Sartre noted that a reductionist dichotomy between Jews and Europeans overlooks the intricate inter-ethnic relations in colonial spaces, whether a French in Algeria or the Dutch in the Caribbean. Indeed, one of the distinguishing features of what Sarah Castell terms Caribbean Jewishness is its elasticity and its coexistence with other religious and ethnic groups and identities. And it is this elasticity and complicatedness that makes this history disruptive and so relevant to contemporary debates on racism, anti-Semitism, and othering. It also points us to directions in which Jewish studies can and perhaps should go. Jews disrupt racial boundaries. This is seen by the long running discussions of are Jews white that have played out in European Jewish history. And that was also evident in colonial spaces where Jews became categorized as white as systems of racialized categorization took hold. It's also clear in the fact that 12 to 15% of Jews in the Americas today define themselves as being non-white. Many people of Caribbean descent in the Netherlands too claim at least some Jewish ancestry, even if they don't identify as Jewish. As a Surinamese author, Cynthia McLeod remarked, quote, every Surinamese has Jewish blood, shake a family tree and a Jew falls out, unquote. Jewish studies generates issues and questions that can be applied to the thought and practice of difference generally not just in colonial spaces. The Jew is a representative of diaspora, of dissident culture, of discrimination and exclusion, 
Jewish history serves as a basis to build bridges across supposedly different histories and different histories of diaspora, especially. Theorists such as Memi, Arndt, Césaire, Fanon, who I already mentioned, and also the African-American thinker W.E.B. Du Bois, all did this in the mid 20th century. They connected the histories of colonialism, Jews, and anti-Black racism. They seem to be pointing towards new ways of considering Jewish and colonial histories. They thought about what connections might exist between the genocides that occurred in Europe during the Shoah and those that occurred in the colonies as part of European imperialism, just not within the continent of Europe itself. Building bridges across supposedly different histories, using Jews and Jewish history as case studies for understanding difference is an approach my research takes and will continue to take. But I believe we also need to be cautious with this approach. Jews aren't just valuable as an allegory for the circumstances of other people and their cultures or as a point of comparison to make some bigger point. They, we, aren't just important or useful as illustrations of something else. That attitude, as historian Moshe Rosman says, is just another iteration of how chroniclers felt the imperative to document the contributions of the Jews. Nasi and Chumachero felt the need to assert the contribution of their Jewish communities in the places they called home, and thereby prove how much Jews belonged there. They were part of a long tradition of a justification version of Jewish history, a history that has, as its subtext, the knowledge that, at any time, Jews' belonging could be called into question. Mine certainly was. I thought I belonged in my school back in Kentucky. I was blithely unaware of my own difference, but others weren't. When I was around seven, a classmate told me that, quote, there were missionaries for people like you, unquote. Although I was born and raised in Richmond, had gone to that school as long as she had, apparently my belonging was in question. I was white with the privilege that accompanied that in the 1970s and 1980s in the American South, but not Christian in need of missionizing, not totally in the right place, apparently. At the same time, though, my family and I were not observant enough, too secular, not really quite Jewish enough to feel fully accepted by Jewish communities elsewhere, including here in the Netherlands. The history of Jews in the Dutch Caribbean colonies and the contradictions that seem to be engendered by this encounter greater freedom, but enslavement, making homes, but in places taken from others, offers us a chance to move beyond the apologetic, defensive stance of justifying Jewish belonging. We can attempt to disprove the false equivalencies and competitive comparisons. Who has suffered more in history, Jews or Blacks? Looking at Caribbean Jewish history allows us to rethink and reframe these comparisons and questions. Here, Michael Rothberg's concept of multidirectional memory shows the way. We can move instead to really confront difference, but also overlaps as experiences such as diaspora, agency, oppression, resistance, violence, and genocide show us in these histories. These are all questions that the Israelites confronted in Egypt as they settled prospered, were enslaved, killed, and resisted. And thinking about the lessons of this story, we're still faced with the Passover question. How Jews could have enslaved others, maybe even had enslaved people serve them as they sat at a table and commemorated how God led them out of bondage in Egypt with, as we are told, a mighty hand. I have to think about the Haggadah they used. We know from various sources that one of the Haggadot used in the Caribbean. It was written in Spanish, published in 1689 by David Pardo, who came to Suriname. In this Haggadah, the matzah is displayed. The service continues and all say, this is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are in need come and celebrate Passover. This year we are here, this year to come, 
the year to come in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves, next year free people in the land of Israel. The land of Israel at this time and in this passage was illusory, an idea rather than, an into, than a reality, a memory of their ancestors, a place few had ever been and ever thought to go. Surinam or Curaçao was home, a place that they had made in a colonial space with synagogues, ritual bathhouses, schools, mezuzot on the doors and cemeteries for their dead. By calling these places home, these Jews in the colonies were expressing a sense of entitlement, control, and familiarity. David Nasi called Suriname home, and his essay delves with deep familiarity into the landscapes and the peoples of this colony. Abraham Chumachero argued that Jews were entitled to vote because Curacao was their home, the place they always returned home to. I assert that Kentucky is my home, by pontificating on bourbon and making sure I pronounce Louisville correctly. Yet no home is permanent. No group is ever permanently rooted or permanently diasporic and power over places, communities and identities can be gained or lost. We see this in the Dutch Caribbean. Once the home and core of American Jewry now dwindled away to a few remnants, around 300 in Curacao, fewer in Suriname. 306 South Third Street, my home, sold, lost. The Lower East Side of my grandparents' youth, a romantic memory rather than a center of Jewish life. Likewise, so many Jewish neighborhoods in Amsterdam after the Shoah. The conventional Jewish historical narrative of expulsion, dispersion, and consequent exile provokes comment, not only about whether an emotion, where an emotional home is located, but also about whether a Jew can be at home anywhere. The hope of Passover is next year in Jerusalem, a hope for a home that is at once quite literal and has become a reality with the establishment of the state of Israel, but it is also far more symbolic. It is the hope for a place of identity and intimacy and belonging, of at-homeness without the exile. It is perhaps no surprise that Passover, that preeminent story of history and history making, is celebrated not in a synagogue, but at home. After all, it was the doorposts of the Jewish houses that were marked so that the angel of the Lord would pass over them when he came to slay the Egyptians. Houses, homes, were safe. I may not have felt completely at home in Kentucky, just as I may not feel completely at home in the Netherlands. But I did feel safe in my home as my family and friends gathered around our table in Richmond, Kentucky, eating the ritual foods, dropping the horseradish, symbol of the bitterness of enslavement onto the pages of our Haggadah. The Haggadah my family used was much like Pardo's in Suriname, but with one small important exception. And the ones I still have, stained with wine and charoset from years of celebrations, the Israelites' predicament is universalized. Instead of only the Israelites being freed in the coming year, the passage reads, now many are still enslaved. Next year, may all men be free. This Haggadah was put together in the 1970s, and despite being very inclusive for its time, let me add that my hope is that all people, men and women, may be free. Passover then is about optimism and hope for the future. I often felt like losing hope during all those years in academic positions with no stability, no permanence. It was my own personal journey through the wilderness. I'm not sure that I want to equate the Vrai Universiteit with the promised land. <laughs> but I do want to thank the Vrai Universiteit and particularly the Faculty of Religion and Theology for giving me an academic home and an institutional place of belonging, as well as such a very warm welcome from so many of you all in the room here today. This chair was facilitated by the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute. I'm grateful to them, the city of Amsterdam, and to the Jewish community in Amsterdam and the rest of the, ne and the, rest of the Netherlands for their support. Although I lacked stability and permanence there, 
I had more of a home than I knew or appreciated at the time at the Kaitilve in Leiden. My thanks to all my former colleagues there, many of whom are also in the room today. Antoinette Schrapper, now my colleague here at The View, and especially the CCC team of Stacey McDonald, Walter Veenendal, and Gertost Indy, none of whom can be here today, which saddens me greatly, and Sana Rottmeier, who I'm very glad can join. At Passover, we read from the Song of Songs. For lo, the winter is past, flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing is here. It's a festival of renewal. Some of you know what a difficult time this has been in my life. I don't know if the winter has passed yet. I hope that it is. But even if not, I know that my dear friends, Laurel, Alex, and very especially Harriet, will continue to be there to support me. I don't know what I would have done without you all. Home is about belonging and also about family. My family is with me today with one notable exception. My mother, Lita, of blessed memory, died last fall. She would have been so proud and happy to be here. The last time my father came to the Netherlands was in 2009 when I defended my dissertation at Leiden. Some of you all here now joined us then in that overly warm Sinatskammer. Now, almost 14 years later, he's come again. He, more than anyone else, knows what this means to me. Thank you, Dad. Sophia, Doug, Sean, thank you for being here today with me too. History is about what is remembered and about what is forgotten. I forget everything. My sister, Susanna Lura Reutemann, forgets nothing. She is the keeper of memories, the keeper of our shared history. I would be lost without you in this world. My son, Maximilian Darius Reutemann, now 20, knows no other life than one shadowed by my career, one in which I was holed up in my study or in conferences or off in archives somewhere. I thank his father, Martin, for all he did during those years. Darius, you saw me coming home crying so many times because I just missed out on another grant or didn't get another job, or worse still, a job had been created for a younger Dutch man while I was told that there simply weren't any positions available for me. In the Passover Seder, we say Dayenu. It would have been enough as a reminder to be satisfied with God's gifts to us. Yet despite what a gift from God you were and are to me, we all know that I wouldn't have been satisfied. Nothing would have been enough other than standing here today. I had the sure and certain belief that this was not only what I wanted, but what I deserved. Darius, my beautiful boy, it's okay not to know what you want in life, but if there's one lesson to be learned from all my years in the proverbial desert, it's to know what you deserve and not to accept anything less. Thank you above all, I love you. I know that I'm now at the view and at home here, but allow me to draw on the Leiden tradition and say, ik heb het gezegd, I've said it, thank you. Highly learned Professor Reitman, dear Jessica. What a brilliant, personal, intriguing, and nuanced lecture you have given us. You got my attention from start to finish, not only because I have my personal connection with Suriname and the Dutch Caribbean. You brought so many new and relevant insights. For starters, the fact that the strongest Jewish presence in the Americas for a long time was not New York, 
with Brazil, Suriname, Curaçao, and Jamaica. One of the great contributions of thoughtful historians like you is that they deconstruct any simple interpretation we might have of the past. You are an expert in uncovering the ambivalences of, in this case, the Jewish presence in the Caribbean. How to make sense of the fact that they were at the same time diasporic, outsiders to the white community, people who left Europe in search of a place where they could be more at home, more free to live their lives as Jews, and at least some of them, owners of slaves and plantations, occasionally even involved in violent confrontation with the Maroons. What, you ask, what does the Passover question mean under such circumstances? And that profound question, easily misused for anti-Semitic tropes of the cruel slave owner, is one of the fundamental questions for theology, Jewish and Christian alike. How is it possible that people who know that their life and freedom is a divine gift deprive others of that gift of life and freedom? And although it is by definition an historical fallacy to impose contemporary moral reasoning onto the past, the same question can be asked today in so many contexts. And then your lecture warns us not to embrace simple answers, but to look for complexities and ambivalences. The key notion in your beautiful lecture is homemaking, a very personal topic, as you tell us, but also a very powerful theoretical concept to understand the processes you study. Homemaking is not so much or not only a concrete process at one's place of origin, or probably even somewhere else. It's also a process of redefining personal and collective identity vis-a-vis -vis both the context of origin and the context of destination. It becomes a relevant topic when home is not self-evident. It becomes a creative process of invention and reimagination, application of old customs and appropriation of new ones, materializing personal and communal values in concrete places, buildings, and practices. And in all that, you say, the notion of home remains elusive, connecting the concrete here and now with the transcendent notion of a spiritual home, Jerusalem. And by looking at those ambivalence of history and the dynamics of homemaking, you offer a much-needed critique and critical reflection on colonialism, a topic we're all dealing with today. Because apart from maybe the staunchest of anti-woke critics, it is by now well understood that colonialism is tantamount to injustice, exploitation, and extractivism. And this easily leads to a polarized picture of the good and the bad, and perhaps the ugly, without understanding that although the concept of perpetrator and victim may be clear, reality is much more complex to identify. And this, Jessica, is why we are so delighted today. So delighted to have you as our new professor of Jewish studies. Because you have the incredible capacity to move from a small local incident somewhere in the Caribbean in say the 18th century to global movements and fundamental concepts and back. You have the honesty and the ability to look at the role and the position of the Jewish community and sympathize with them in a critical mode. You are a professor of Jewish studies, fully engaged, but without partisanship. And you are not only an expert on Jewish history in Amsterdam, but also in the seemingly even more diasporic context of the Caribbean. In other words, you are a master of decentering our perspective, which is precisely what we need when we think of colonialism, of Eurocentric knowledge, of Christian domin domination, also in our faculty, of patriarchy, and so much more. The Faculty of Religion and Theology at Freie Universiteit has had a long interest in Jewish studies. Named differently over time, there have been several chairs in Judaism in our faculty, as well as in the Faculty of Philosophy and the Faculty of Social Sciences. And we are most grateful to the City of Amsterdam and our partners in the Menasse Ben Israel Institute the Jewish Historical Museum and University of Amsterdam, that we were able to establish this chair. And most of all, so grateful to add the unique voice of a scholar like you to the debate about Jewish studies here in Amsterdam. Let me conclude on a practical note. 
After the ceremony, there will be a reception where you can congratulate our new professor. Be advised that you don't need to stand in line until you see Jessica alone or almost alone. Please enjoy the company of others. Eat and drink what will be offered to you. I close this public session of the Council of Deans. May our search for truth and wisdom be of service to the flourishing of the world and humankind.